This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Anderson Windows. If you're a window installer, you deserve a simple choice. Anderson 400 Series Windows. They're the windows contractors trust the most, based on a 2022 survey of U.S. contractors. Probably because they have fewer callbacks and extra peace of mind. And thanks to shortened lead times, they're available faster. Make your go-to windows Anderson 400 Series. Request a quote at andersonwindows.com. Also brought to you by Loctite PL Premium Max. Professional builders know the value of a durable and versatile construction adhesive. Say no to second-guessing quality. Say yes to Loctite's strongest adhesive, PL Premium Max. Equally effective for interior and exterior use, PL Premium Max can be applied in all but the most extreme weather conditions and bonds to all common building materials. It offers 20 minutes of working time and cures solid in 24 hours, with no air bubbles for maximum durability. Whether you're framing a custom home, upgrading to granite kitchen counters, or adding rigid foam and comfort to an existing basement, PL Premium Max is the right adhesive for the job. Say yes to Loctite's strongest construction adhesive. Visit LoctiteProducts.com for more information. A or straw is going to be your cheapest option. But then you have to keep the water out of it because that will just act like a sponge. Oh, and that would be a mess. Yeah, uh, it'll be a shoveling mess no out what. feet of rotten hay. Oh my goodness! You need an army of goats to clear it out. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today, I'm joined by Editorial Director for Fine Home Building and GBA, Andrew Zellner. Glad to be back, Patrick. Good to see you, Andrew. Operations Manager for TDS Custom Construction, Ian Schwant. Good morning. And our producer, Jeff Rose. Hi there. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So, Andrew, how was your uh, trip to the Boundary Waters briefly? Uh, it was fantastic. Um, yeah, the you know as uh, I've I've shared with you guys, I go to the Boundary Waters every summer, and it's the it's basically the lakes and rivers between Minnesota and Canada. Um, and so it's about five five and a half hours north of Minneapolis, where I live, and it was it's fantastic. You know, you go up there, and you're like frantically like responding to emails and like. <laughs> You know, making sure your life doesn't fall apart. And at some point, you're like, cell, for, cell service just cuts off. And then you're like off the grid uh, for, uh, let's say I was off the grid for from like Wednesday night through like Monday morning. Um, and it was it was fantastic. A little bit of rain paddling in um, and then some rain the last night. So we had to paddle in portage with wet gear, uh, which isn't a huge deal because at that point, you're just like, I, I, you know, you're just craving that warm food and that hot shower. And, um, yeah, it was great. I, uh, I usually sleep in a hammock and like for the last few years, I've sort of cobbled together like a mosquito net and then you hang a tarp above it. Um, but this year I, I sprung for the all in one hammock tent in one package. Um, and it performed super well. So I'll probably just put that in the, the fine home building office when I come now to visit instead of <laughs> renting a hotel room. <laughs> You got some great trees out back. <laughs> the, the mosquitoes are that bad in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I think that's awesome. That's one of the parks I uh, on my most wanted list. I have never been, and uh, I think uh, most folks have not been there. It's one of the lesser visited, as, as I understand it. Yeah, and it you know it's it's not. I don't think it's a national park. It's like a nationally protected like land area. And so mm. one of the cool things is that like there are no motors. And there's no like air airplane traffic over it. So so it, it is like really like to do it, you have to be in a canoe and you have to carry all your gear and portage out there. Um, and actually this year, because uh, of so many people like trying it out over the last couple of years, they limited the number of permits they issued by like an extra 30 percent. So we really really only saw a few folks at portages and otherwise it was just like our group of uh eight folks out there wow that's cool yeah ian what have you been doing 
you sleeping outside? Sh- no, no. <laughs> I, I am an avid indoorsman, as I believe I've <laughs> said on here before. Uh, it, someday, Andrew can explain to me what portage means other than a, a town in central Wisconsin. Carrying stuff is what Wisconsin. that means. <laughs> um, no, That's I when you run out of water shop. and you have to carry your boat. Yeah, yeah it sounds excruciating. <laughs> uh, I think I'd rather split wood or demo something. But uh, I fired up the shop and made some floating shelves for the, the scullery at the house. Uh, as many people know, we didn't, didn't put a lot of effort into finishing that area. Just got it to good enough. And about two weeks ago, Sarah started pulling everything out of the cabinets and reorganizing which i took as my cue to build shelving so i use the hover brackets i don't know if you've ever seen those it's two metal brackets uh, they work a little bit like a french cleat but then they have another lower interlocking part that you can screw together from underneath the shelf and they they claim to hold i believe 300 pounds on an eight inch shelf and that fits in a groove in the shelf Ian? Yep. yep. So I routed a groove in the back of uh, the ash timber shelf, and it had the two piece bracket. So one part went into the groove, and the other part screwed to the wall. The one thing that I did learn is that the wall, if it's not perfectly dead flat, it uh, can make it very difficult to hang the shelf on. So by by the time I got to the third and final shelf, I kind of had it down. So I'm guessing you have to shim the uh, wall bracket uh, to make yep. it completely flat. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you use washers or is it something more sophisticated than that? I just used shims. Uh-huh. Just used what I had. But in uh, true home woodworking fashion, I did have to go back and re-sand the shelves from all the blood that I spilled <laughs> on the shelf while hanging it on the wall. What uh? What... What makes something a scullery, Ian? A uh, scullery is a pantry with running water. Okay. It, it, it It's Edwardian, right? And it's uh, yeah. origin. Yeah. 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 So we did Ian's that. Ian's manor so, house on the on yes. the Great Plains there. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that one of our uh, listeners and writers did refer to my estate, my stately <laughs> house. Or however he put it, we'll get to it later. Jeff, you had any excitement in your life? Uh, not a whole lot, no. Okay. I got You're going to get back on that deck rail pretty soon, am I right? Uh, well, I, I talked about it a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> I just like not having a rail. <laughs> it, you like the, the open view, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I get it. So have you thought about the uh, very expensive glass panels? <laughs> no, I, I actually, I bought the, the cable rail. I've got all the elements. I just need to put it together. Gotcha. Well, if you want a you know weekend work group, Andrew said he'd be willing to stop by yeah. next time he's in the office, which I think Absolutely. is going to be sometime in October. Yeah, well, I, I've got hundreds of holes I need to drill, so <laughs> <laughs> sounds you awesome. You can set up the tent hammock in your backyard. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a tool test. I uh, I was away too. Uh, I went to the beach in Maine for a few days. Uh, Ocean Park, Maine, which is a lovely little spot. I think I sent the fine home building staffers a photo of the lovely uh, church that's in the uh, town uh, center. And uh, it's octagonal, very much like a round barn and a very handsome building. I'll put photos of that on the podcast page if you are interested. But it got me thinking about the uh, housing that's currently on our nation's seashores. You know, it used to be you know, probably into the sixties or seventies, like when you had a beach house, it was, it was very simple shack, shack like structure, you know, when the heavy storm would come every year, every few years it blew away and you and your friends would put it back together and it was no big deal. But, you know, in, uh, the area I was in, in Maine, all those little, uh, beach houses are being converted into multi-story, much more elaborate homes. And, uh, the thing that, uh, was thought provoking is that we as taxpayers, uh, you know, are helping to insure these homes with the, uh, federal flood insurance program. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not sure this is a good idea to be building these homes so close to the water in times of climate change. What do you guys think? 
It seems very short-sighted and like a, it, you know, I always like to, you know, like build it right the first time. Like it's, yeah, it seems, it seems very short-sighted. Um, there's actually an article that named Duluth, Minnesota, sort of like the last piece of civilization we, we hit on the way to the Boundary Waters as like one of the best cities to live in if you're concerned about climate change. And what was the basis for that, Andrew? Uh, I think it's proximity to Lake Superior um, and then also sort of its its elevation um, and and like and and facilities, you know, like they've so it, it like is on Lake Superior. Um, so there's a ton of fresh water. Uh, and then also it like climate wise, it's like, I think it's in, in seven or right on the cusp. And so as, as things get warmer, it'll still be hospitable for centuries. Hmm. I don't know. It's going to take some convincing to get me, me, me to move some places <laughs> cold as Duluth, Minnesota. <laughs> Um, you know, so I got back from my trip and I found this uh, piece in the New York Times, uh, Climate Change Beach House Erosion, and it talks about the very problem that we identified just here just now. So I'll put that on the podcast page if anyone's curious about how the uh, New York Times reports on uh, housing at the beach. I'd be curious to hear what you think. I, I do have a I have got a great solution. Uh, What's that? A hammock tent. <laughs> <laughs> You did touch on another issue about a, a lot of places we're building, Andrew, that don't have access to fresh water. And for me, I, I just I can't get over the amount of homes being built in areas that, that don't have access to water and may never again have real access to water. What's going to happen to all these population centers, especially in the Southwest and in California, if they can't get enough water to take care of their population? They're all going to move to Duluth, Minnesota. <laughs> there has been some discussion, and I don't know if it's legitimate, about, you know, piping fresh water from the Great Lakes to the southwest. That seems like a crazy undertaking. You know, do you think we could do that? Uh, there is a like a consortium or a cartel of the, the governments of all of the states and provinces that border the Great Lakes. I don't know exactly when it was formed, but it was formed to stop that from happening. Uh, some of the stuff that I've seen is actually more geared toward piping rainwater runoff from west of the Mississippi. So all of the, the areas now that would divert into the Mississippi River, there's talk of trying to find ways to pipe that water at least to the, the east side of the Rockies. I think hmm. most of what I've read on the west side of the Rockies talks about desalination as the the way that they hope to solve that issue. I mean, that can be done. It's very expensive, obviously, but, you know, it's it's proven technology. Uh, as always, we got some great feedback. This comes from Brent. Hey, podcast crew, I wanted to write in mostly to say a big thank you for answering my ADU-related questions a few episodes back. I really appreciate everyone's feedback. I think I'm actually going to go with the flea market chandelier option for lighting. Uh, you can keep an eye out the elephant's tusk for me. There could be a modest commission in for, for you. <laughs> it's the elephant's trunk. Um, I'm starting to realize that your fine home building podcast is more highbrow than I bargained for. <laughs> Must be your Greenwich perspective. <laughs> <laughs> the discussion in episode 479 regarding the cost of building a one-story versus two-story really piqued my interest. I actually went through a similar thought spreadsheet uh, thought slash spreadsheet exercise when considering my ADU building. Interestingly, I think my conclusions were a little bit different than what Ian found and what analyzing the options for this palatial, his palatial <laughs> 2,000 square foot home. <laughs> When I analyzed a one versus two story option for my theoretical 770 square foot ADU, the tempting point making the one story option cheaper was the extra area required for stairs and wall thicknesses in a two story build. I determined that to have the same usable net area, you'd need another 100 square feet of extra gross area for the two story option. This extra 100 square feet can potentially easily be lost in the butler's pantry 
or scullery of a 2,000 square foot palace, but it is a 13% uh, amount of 770 square foot, adding quite a bit of cost. Uh, in the end, I decided to go for the single floor option for the more product reasons like the accessibility, aesthetics, overlook onto the other properties and the ease of building. I also agree that there is probably more cost savings to be had in material choices, assemblies, and building form than just one versus a two-story decision. If you're running low on questions, I also had a bit of fun one for you. What fasteners slash consumables supplies does everyone keep on hand as amateur remodelers, homeowners, building geeks? Do you buy as needed, store them in a certain way, have a few random stuff jars that constantly get in the way? I'd be interested to hear what everyone has to say. I'll, I'll, anyways, thanks as always, and I will hopefully be reaching out again soon to Jeff for his efficient services once I find the right <laughs> patio door to commit to. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Ian, what do you good. keep on, on hand? What, what is your favorite stuff to keep around? Uh, anything that is used for fastening something to concrete. Because I think that it's really a, a specialty fastener that you often need for whether it's uh, hanging anything on a concrete wall or fastening anything to a concrete floor. And they aren't something that you can just go to any hardware store or uh, building supply center to get. So one of one of my favorites is, I think they're called a Z-Map. Uh, so it's a metal sleeve that you drill a larger hole into the concrete and then it has a hardened nail in it, which expands the metal sleeve into the I concrete. I love those things. Those are amazing. Yeah. yeah. And you can attach almost anything to concrete with them. So uh, that's one of my favorite ones to to keep around. Even though I don't do much in concrete work anymore, they tend to that's be. That's what struck me as odd. Like you're a carpenter. Like I thought you would have said I have uh, construction screws in every length from like one inch up to four or six or. I don't need whatever. to. Menards does that for me, and they're twenty <laughs> minutes away, and I drive past one every day. <laughs> and they don't have the concrete fasteners. Uh, as, Oftentimes, they have yeah. a, a really small selection of them. So Interesting. for me, it's anything that's hard to find or uh, very specialty is the thing that's going to save you. What about tape? Tape. tape. Gotta have tape. Construction tape, duct tape, electrical All tape. It. All of it, the, yeah. Yeah. I, tape is one of those things that you don't think about until you absolutely need it. Uh, just even in site protection work, you use so many different tapes. Oftentimes you'll tape the perimeter of a wood floor with a, a tape that peels off easily. And then you'll use another heavier bonding tape to hold something down taped on top of that tape. And it delights me that you're a tape fetishist. <laughs> I, I love tape. We, we get into really spirited arguments at work about tape versus caulk and the uh, air sealing sure. uh, applications and then, uh, myself and another one of our carpenters, we consider ourselves to be house gift wrapper, gift wrappers, where we would just wrap <laughs> the entire house in tape, call it sealed. Uh, Jeff, Andrew, thoughts? Uh, I, so the the big big thing for me was I had just been like buying fasteners as I needed them for projects, and like couldn't always find the same brand of fasteners, or even you know with the you know, the same star head shape or size. Um, and so I've committed to buying just one brand and and one uh, one, one drive tip style. Are you going to name drop who the whose fastener is your favorite? Uh, so I'm still I'm still in between two uh, based on like where I'm closest to shopping. Um, but I, I think I think I'm going to end up going GRK um, just because I'm at Home Depot all the time and they seem to be in stock. The most um, are you going to have jeff come and do a commitment ceremony <laughs> officially choose grk as your i mean it's your a, lifetime screw me it's, it's a it's a big deal you know um and and i've i've tried to be a lot better about not just using drywall screws for everything um because that was <laughs> that Those was also very so easy. much yeah. forgive me for saying they're yeah. great for drywall but everything else they're terrible 
During, during my much younger days, I used like three and a half inch drywall screws for everything. Oh and man, yeah. One time, that's all there old, was, right? An old yeah. timer came and put one into his stud about halfway, and then lightly hit it with his hammer, and <laughs> it snapped off yeah. immediately. And showed me GRKs for the first time, and did the same thing, and his hammer bounced off of it. That was the end of me using long drywall screws. I would say for me, I do have screws in every length that are at all common. And, uh, you know, very fortunately in my work, we use a ton of the structural screws for uh, testing mm -hmm. uh, and building props and stuff. So, you know, I have those in all different lengths. And oftentimes they're very handy for temporary, you know, st structures. Um, so I use them over and over again. It's kind of great. And I have tape in every persuasion, blue tape, masking tape, yellow masking tape, uh, electrical tape. Uh, Scotch 88, I always have a roll of that because uh, I love it so much. And uh, more recently, I've been, you know, sure to have the um, 3M flashing uh, material on hand at all times. Yeah. How many different colors of electrical tape do you have? Um, I think I have four. I have, in addition That's to black, number. white, <laughs> green, and red, right? Because... Oftentimes, if you have big conductors, you know, you don't buy individually jacketed uh, conductors, so you tape them to indicate their function. Jeff, you have anything uh, uh, that we haven't mentioned uh, here? Uh, no, I mean, I, I just, I have recently, like, bought the giant box of GRKs and, like, the, you know, the, the common lengths and so invested in that lifetime supply <laughs> so do yeah. you do you keep uh all your fasteners in one you know uh toolbox all organized or is it a cardboard box of smaller cardboard boxes i i've got i've got the um you know a, a plastic bin with the individual bins inside and they're labeled and all that nonsense even you know some of them that have like weird tips because I've got some mm -hmm. smaller ones that, you know, I need to go to like a T15. I have a uh, Milwaukee Packout fastener sorter, and uh, it is fantastic. It is just incredibly thoughtful in its design. The little bins, unlike a lot of sorters, come out so you can leave the box and take the size fastener you need with you. It's just really smart. It doesn't spill unless you leave it open. I, I I've got the same I one, cry. <laughs> and and I miss I'm missing one bin, and I have no idea where it is. But it's been driving me driving me. You nuts. left that in some stud cavity somewhere, Andrew. Yeah, that's, certainly. I, I'm convinced. <laughs> Did you have to make a little block out of wood to hold the rest of the bins from shifting? <laughs> no, so you're missing the, the bin. The bins all like lock in place when you close the lid. Okay. It's it's pretty slick. Yeah. This comes from Mark with a C. Hi, podcast crew. Thanks for the show. It's a welcome addition to my commuting playlist, and the mix of advice and experiences shared is informative and entertaining. With Barbara's Room and Room Shop project talked about in episode 475, no one mentioned the possibility of actually framing a room inside the space, and I wondered if that would work. There is the added expense because she would be framing two additional walls at the perimeter, but it would allow the walls to be assembled and then easily insulated and air sealed. Plus, if the ceilings of the original building are tall enough, you could flame, frame a flat ceiling, air seal, and insulate as you would in a typical home build. This approach could easily be reversed as well. If she used screws for assembly, that would make deconstruction even easier. Where the room is not a structural component, the use of screws should be okay, right? Uh, thoughts? Yeah, it sounds great to me. What do you guys think? Did we suggest this? I think we did. I thought we did too, but sometimes I mix up, you know, podcast <laughs> episodes, what what we talked about. Did you see any problems with this, Jeff? Um, no, just I, I think that generally, though, Barbara is very frugal and the extra. <laughs> She's going to want to build something else with those, uh, the material used in those two walls. Yeah, right? yeah. I, gonna, I, I like, did one of the things I thought of after the fact was those um the steel panels are screwed to the studs what about just unscrewing those and putting some sort of sheathing on it and then putting them back we should have you on the show more 
<laughs> I didn't think about it during the show. It wasn't yeah. until after this. Like, hey, wait a minute. When I, when I was doing the edit and looking at the pictures. <laughs> This comes from Nat. Dear Fine Home Building folks, uh, first, thanks for all the great tips, tricks, and thoughts and banner you offer every week. Listening to this podcast has helped me get through some tedious bits of work, mostly in the office, but occasionally on the site as well. More on that below. Second, I was listening to your recent segment regarding workshop space in a damp basement, and it made me think of two resources. The first is an FHB article on damp proofing basements for three severities of water intrusion and has some really good graphics and explanations. Sadly, I can't track it down right now, but it was integral to the design of our tall crawl insulation and drainage system. The second resource is Building Science Corporation's Builder's Guide to Mixed Humid Climates, and I think it has a solution that might be right up your listener's alley creating a semi permeable sleeper system to control dampness while also facilitate drying. The detail can be found on page 180 and goes as follows. Paint a semi-permeable sealer on the top side of the concrete slab over which you install a thin layer of semi-permeable foam, three-quarter XPS is specced. On top of the foam, you install one by furring strips at 16 inches on center or 24 inches on center and install ply a plywood subfloor. Excess moisture can migrate up through the assembly and be dealt with by a dehumidifier. Hope this helps. Third, I was wondering if you could offer some advice. My wife and I are doing a complete rebuild of our old farmhouse, as in there was a house, then there wasn't a house, and now there's a house again, and she and I are the ones swinging the hammers. Actually, I'm doing her a disservice if I didn't say she's pretty good with a nail gun these days. We just got a line on some reclaimed flooring. The only catch is we need to demo and move it. It's two and a quarter inch wide red oak that, from the looks of it. We just Should we just keep going without him? Do, will anyone notice? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you listening, we just lost Andrew. Um, I think he might have got bored with my blathering on here. He was telling us before that he was having some electrical issues this morning because they were having thunderstorms. Should I just keep going? Sure. Okay. Uh do you have any recommendation for removing the flooring with the least amount of damage and then storing it for a few months in a way that will resist as much warping as possible? Anything I should keep in mind where reinstalling it? Any advice you can throw our way would be greatly appreciated. I attached a picture of the house under construction. We kept the same footprint of the original with some minor modifications to prevent the whole back half from being eaten by termites again. If you want to le learn more about it, let me know and I can talk your ears off on the topic. Also, if you ever have that owner builder Q&A panel you mentioned a while back, let me know. I'd love to be on it if, you've ha if you'd have me. Uh, thanks for all the great content and motivation, Nat. Nat, I'd love to have uh, an owner builder uh, group again. Uh, what do you think about that idea, guys? That'd be fun, right? Yeah, we've talked yeah. about it a couple yeah. times. Make a good after show. It totally would. Um, Nat, get in touch with us, and uh, we'll have you on the after show, and we'll talk about your build. I think that'd be fun. What, what do, do you, you think about their not-quite-reclaimed flooring? I don't think he can call it reclaimed until he reclaims it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, interestingly, uh, I know someone who's done this. Andrew, good to have you back. Sorry, we're having a little bit of a thunderstorm here, so uh, I heard, a, I heard a, a crack, and my internet went out. So uh, glad to have you back. We're talking about uh, Nat's uh, reclaimed oak flooring. So um, I know someone has done this, and they just uh, used a flat shovel to uh, pop it up. And it, it comes up pretty readily if it's nailed. If it's stapled down, forget about it. It's not going anywhere. It would be my uh, uh, summation. So you're saying if it's nailed down with the wedge-shaped cleat nails, it comes yeah. up easier? Yeah, I don't cool. know why, but the staples do not give up. I think it's the glue that's on the legs. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I don't know, uh, Nat. I think it would be a good opportunity to buy a uh, new tool. Um, the, there's a couple, like, flooring removal tools, and forgive me, I will put them on the podcast page, but I can't think of uh, – uh, the Gutster is the name of it, <laughs> and it's got, like – a pronged uh, fork assembly at the bottom with wheels and a fulcrum, and you push this thing along and you can pop stuff up. So I think that would be great for that. I think the most important tool he's going to need for this project is patience. 
to not destroy the flooring or just yeah. to get it done? <laughs> <laughs> just to get it done. Is there a good way to remove those nails after you get the flooring up? No. Okay. That's that was going to be my. <laughs> Hours that, and that's hours where I think of, the patient patience really comes in. <laughs> yeah, hours of work. Yeah. I think it's going to be evenings spent uh, doing this, right? Getting it ready, bundling it, stacking it. Um, I think if you stack it reasonably flat in a reasonably climate controlled place, you know, oak flooring is typically quarter quarter sawn, so it's pretty it's pretty uh, stable. Yeah. Uh, Nat goes on, sad, sad I missed the conversation about manual labor. As the son of a landscaper, I really love digging holes and then filling them back in. Uh, <laughs> and punishment growing up was having to go out to the wood pile to split wood by hand. Um, I don't understand. I'm, I'm thinking he's like actually enjoyed that. Am I right? He, he actually likes splitting wood. The, the way you wrote it made me yeah. think that he enjoys splitting wood. Um, he sent a photo of his uh, his uh, house build, and it's a adorable structure. Wouldn't you guys agree? Yeah. It's really yeah, nice. It looks, yeah, it looks looks borderline dreamy. It's like the right and size it, and aesthetic for me, for sure. And immensely practical looking. Yeah. Uh, I, I wrote back and said, uh, Patrick, thanks for the quick response. Building and talking about building are the best life I can imagine. So I would say you are living the dream. I think that's in uh, response to, I think it was probably eight or nine o'clock at night when I emailed him back and I was <laughs> like, I really need to get a life. Um, <laughs> I love the color. It's very Caribbean, I think is how I would describe yeah. it, right? Um, kind of a turquoise uh, aqua color, beautiful. Um, thanks for the feedback on the color. We were actually 100% sure it was staying when we saw how well the salvage studs, which are red oak, turned the corbels slash soffit brackets uh, and works so well with the color. Um, he said the flooring is from an old house slated for demolition at the end of the year. It was conditioned at some point, but no longer. We're in Southwest Virginia climate zone four. I was a little worried if this house had been rained in or what uh, have you, you know, if this stuff uh, swelled to the degree it could have been damaged, right? But, you know, I think, I think it's going to be awesome because it's going to be imperfect. Like you're going to get over that uh, you know, dread of damaging your brand new hardwood floor because <laughs> it's going to already have some character. Any more on this, anyone? Uh, the the only other advice I'd have is uh, if you can Tom Sawyer someone into helping you, yeah. um, go for it. I, I would tell all your friends. And I, I you know, it's funny... Uh, how receptive people are to doing uh, what I would describe as onerous things, if you ask them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, thank you for reminding us, Nat, that uh, fine home building is a great resource for your building projects. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we forget. <laughs> uh, this comes from Jim. Hey, FHB podcast team. I enjoy listening to the podcast discussing building and the science involved. Recently requested feedback on the science of thermodynamics as it relates to understanding by people involved in construction. With an early interest and experience in building, I became a journeyman carpenter while studying for my degree in chemical engineering. I have been a continuous FHB print subscriber from the very first February, March slash 1981 issue. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, episodes 473 and 479 discussions on heat were of particular interest. The HVAC contractor saying that radiant heat in the ceiling was wrong as heat rises through the ceiling may have better reasons for like keeping feet warmer on a radiant heat floor. Actually, as pointed out by your panelists and your engineering responders, the heat will radiate from the source in a straight line. The correct design for the ceiling or floor is to insulate the cold side to help keep the heat in the building. The concept of warm air rising is more of a primary characteristic of a forced air system, but air heated from any source will rise. Temperature for our thermodynamic purpose is a measurement of a substance's average kinetic energy with higher temperature molecules moving faster and colliding with other molecules more often and with greater force. This converts kinetic energy into heat 
The molecules move in all directions with the net effect of heat moves from hot to cold per the second law of thermodynamics. I got to say, this concept of heat moving from hot to cold is fundamental to understanding building science and moisture moving from more to less. Like, once you get your head around those two things, uh, it's easier to get uh, assemblies and, and how to heat and cool them, right? Hot to cold, wet to dry. Yeah. Um, the movement outbound reduces the density, resulting in warmer air being more buoyant than the cooler air around it and thus rising. So what I bring this up again, because we're beating this subject to death, is that last night the uh, Field of Dreams baseball game was being played in a cornfield and everyone was betting, according to our colleague Brian, that it was going to be a home run derby because it's going to be stupidly humid in August this time of day in the Midwest. Does anyone know what the score of that game was? No, no. idea. I don't either. So that's a really bad way to end this conversation. <laughs> Moving <But>. on. <laughs> that was fine. Home building podcast sports. <laughs> <laughs> I can't confirm or deny that moisture problems in an attic are caused by humid air rising, but I believe it is a factor to make a case for less humid air, humid air versus dry air. I have to get into the weeds. Uh, physical chemistry a bit. Apologies for running over my time. <laughs> a fellow named Avo Gadro found that under the same conditions of temperature and pressure, equal volumes of different gases contain an equal number of molecules. The molecules of water, H2O, which is 18 grams per mole, weighs less than the molecules of nitrogen, uh, 28 grams per mole or oxygen 32 grams per mole that air is made of given that specific volume when you have water molecules replacing oxygen or nitrogen molecules the resulting volume has a lower weight and therefore a lower density making the humid air more buoyant than dry air scientists are best suited to provide the theoretical principles of thermodynamics architects engineers and builders can apply the principles in the design equipment and construction of the structure if you are interested in more information on thermodynamics the web is a good source or check out a book like einstein's fridge by paul sen thanks for the podcast happy building jim jim that was a great letter thank you so much his Have comment you guys about scientists being best suited and, and people knowing what information that they need to provide and work with is, is pretty crucial in building science and building properly. Isn't it uh, surprising, though, that folks can have so little understanding of this stuff and be uh, so uh, integral to the construction of, of buildings? And, you know, in a base level, I said it before, like buildings are about keeping out, you know, unconditioned air and keeping in conditioned air. And uh, boy, it seems easier if you get the principles involved. When I went to the timber framing guild conference in Vermont with uh, Mason and Dave from HVP, one of the speakers talked about how buildings only have two enemies, water and stupid men. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we we just wrapped up a feature in the magazine on HRVs and ERVs, and dur during during the creation of that feature, um, you know, I I I went back and like did a bunch of reading about the second law of thermodynamics, and it's like, what well, once you 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 understand that like hot moves to cold, the whole idea of an HRV or ERV like it, it demystifies this like metal box with four ports on it. It's so that that will be coming soon. Hits mailboxes in, in September. That seems like a very uh, useful fine home building piece because I, I, I don't understand the difference. I, you know, I know you're supposed to use one and one in a cooling climate and another in a heating climate, generally speaking, but that's not, it's more nuanced than that. that right, Andrew? It is way more nuanced yeah. than that, which also made it an especially difficult feature to put together because we want to make sure folks have practical advice um, but it is it's a it's dependent on your climate, although the tide seems to be shifting toward ERVs in in most climates based on on uh, cost, especially hmm. they cost less or they cost less to operate. They 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 cost less like the difference between the price difference between an HRV and an ERV has decreased so much that like you don't save as much money by just going with an HRV. 
Gotcha. Well, I look forward to that because I need to learn more about this, right? <laughs> we all do. This comes from Brad. Uh, hello from Southern Ontario. It sounds a little cliche, but longtime listener, first time writer here. I just moved into a new house at the end of June, and I have a question about proper separation and air sealing of the garage from the house. The walls of the garage are covered in unpainted OSB, a material that I initially looked at and thought, yes, I understand why you did that, but boy, is it bad looking. The ceiling is drywall. I'm thinking I would like to put drywall on the walls, mostly because it looks better and would brighten the space. The house is about 10 years old. I believe there is fiberglass insulation in behind the OSB, and it appears to, there appears to be a polyethylene vapor barrier directly below the OSB. Now that we have been here in a while, I'm actually wondering how well sealed the wall is between the house and the garage, although I don't have a particular reason to suspect that it is not well sealed as it is beyond questioning the use of metal electrical boxes. Uh, would you put the drywall right over the OSB or take it down to do a proper air sealing job? Thanks so much. I really enjoy the podcast and particularly your, the sharing of your projects at the beginning of each episode. Boy, Brad, no one has ever said that, so thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? Is the OSB a good air barrier for starters? I think for a garage, you could get away with it. Tape the seams, drywall. It has to be taped, though, right? You can't right? just yeah. rely on the on the OSB. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering OS though, on the partition wall between the garage and the house, shouldn't there already be drywall behind the OSB, just by virtue of the fire separation needs of the two? That's spaces? what I was thinking. There should totally be drywall yeah. uh, between these spaces for fire safety. So yeah, I mean. I'm guessing that there's not drywall. I'm guessing that someone cheaped out and used the OSB or they decided they wanted to hang a bunch of stuff there and put that up there. But I don't think it's safe. I think you need a, you know, drywall separation layer. Would you throw the drywall over the OSB or would you take it down? No, I would put it right over because it's going to make fastening it so much easier. It's <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Andy Angle had me hang uh this is like something you do for your friends only. Uh, hang drywall in a, you know, a 10 foot uh, tall staircase uh, opening, right? Uh, you know, in the ceiling above a staircase. And uh, he put OSB up there to make it easier. And boy, does it. Uh, you can just run those screws anywhere. And it's awesome. You can also use the drywall adhesives that they make now that shoot like uh, out of a foam can. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, and yeah. you can spray a good quantity of that on the OSB and it'll make it a lot easier to get your drywall to attach without having to hold it there and get a bunch of screws in it. Uh, and then you have to tape it. You have to finish it, right? Because the once again, we need an air barrier and unless it's right. taped, it's not going to work. And also for fire safety, it has to be uh, fire Correct. taped, right? At least, what is that, level one? Uh, yep. Yeah, level one finish. Isn't it nice when we have an easy question with an answer? <laughs> it's, it's so nice. Some things are nebulous, some things are easy. Uh, here's one from Jay. Dear FHB friends, question here from a longtime listener. My part and I, partner and I could use your help and expertise. We're about to embark on a small house built in rural Massachusetts. Uh, zone 5, the house will be between 800 and 900 square feet. It's a simple single-story ranch. We would like to have a full basement, but do not have the elevation for a walkout, but are considering a bulkhead. The building site is level and dry. Previously, there was a 1790s farmhouse, of which only a field stone dry stack foundation remains. There is a hole, but there was never a full cellar. Due to financial and time constraints, the house must be phased construction over several years. Can we pour the footing in foundation walls and basement slab with the appropriate insulation and drainage according to code in year one and let that overwinter for a year or two without any building on top? We're concerned about the possibility of frost heave, cracks, and other expensive damage. If it's not feasible, what foundation would be most appropriate for our extended building timeline? Thanks, Jay. So my first question to Jay was, why not wait until you have enough time and money to build the house in its entirety? And, and he wrote back, excellent question. The answer is twofold. First, the building site is located in a river buffer zone, and we've been granted permission by the state to build there due to it being in the former footprint of the old farmhouse. 
For us, this is preferable to clearing or building on undisturbed ground. However, that permission requires us to initiate the construction and show progress within a three-year window. Second, we plan to build a house ourselves and as two working full-time uh, with as two folks working full-time with myriad obligations, this will require us to fit much of the work into weekends and vacation time, which unfortunately stretches the timeline. Hope this clarification helps. Jay. All right. What do you guys think? I'm worried about leaving a foundation uh, without a heated structure on it because all the assumptions about you know, the durability of a, of a foundation assumes that the space is protected from frost. Could you go as far as f like fr framing in the floor and like run some, some heat in the basement? So my, my instinct was to say no, but I dug around in some old fine home building stuff and old GBA <laughs> stuff and found that Martin <laughs> Holiday did this one time. And he lists in the comments that he filled the foundation full of hay to insulate the, the floor and the walls. Oh. And while he, he wouldn't necessarily do it again, uh, it sounded like it worked. But I agree with Andrew. I, I think get the floor system over it and then cover it with some waterproofing material, either an awesome tarp or some EPDM and get it. Is that a ditched. brand of tarp? <laughs> no, but it should be. It should be. <laughs> I think that's Barbara our million should, dollar idea. Barbara <laughs> should start that company. Yeah. Awesome tarp. Start building awesome tarps in her in her shed. Uh, but I think if you had some really great waterproofing over the top of a, a deck and got it to pitch all the water away, and as you backfilled your foundation, if you added more pitch than you would like to have to keep water shedding away from the structure you give it a fighting shot, but it's a really risky thing to do. I completely understand Jay's reason for doing it, though. Uh, it's funny that uh, Vermont comes up in this conversation, right? <laughs> you, you know, because mm -hmm. if you drive around rural Vermont, you will occasionally see a foundation with a floor system on top of it. And I suspect these homes date to a certain period when folks were moving back to the land uh, and building their homestead as time and money permitted. But, you know, oftentimes these floor systems look like they're decades old now and whatever was covering them. Uh, EPDM seems to hold up really well. Everything else, not so much. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the rubber membrane is both a good waterproofing and air barrier. So you, you at least have a fighting chance of keeping the space, uh, you know, somewhat warmed up. There'd be an al alternate foundation. Yeah. I thought about that. Like, uh, immediately I thought of, um, uh, uh, wood permanent wood, uh, foundation, but I think it still could heave. It might not like mm -hmm. break it up. Uh, but I don't know, maybe it would do that too. I don't know. So when when you pour a like a a frost protected like shallow slab foundation, like could could that be exposed to the elements for an extended period of time? I think it could because um, I think it could. I mean, I mean, it seems more likely owing to the details that go into that the with the gravel layer especially underneath it right that would that mm -hmm. would help protect it from heaving and breaking my thought went immediately to rural buildings like around the farms near where i live most of those are not heated but they do have some kind of concrete foundation and footings seem to how's not that heave. work ian I, we have a couple buildings that have you know, blown apart block on them from water getting in and freezing and thawing. But uh, for the most part, it seems to work okay. And Andrew's frost protected shallow footing, that's a common slab detail for uh, a pole barn or some other kind of uh, rural building, which oftentimes are not built to any code because they don't require you to for that style of building. I'm going to appeal to our listeners for help with this one because it has me stumped. And I would just tell you to wait, but given this scenario, uh, you can't. So uh, we're either going to have to get the building to a point where it's going to 
protect itself or we're going to have to have a foundation that works similarly. So well, maybe about, our listener. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, what about ICFs? But don't you still, still think they're going to be susceptible to heaving? I don't you're know. That's why no. you've, got to, you've got to fill the basement full of hay to keep it somewhat <laughs> insulated at that footing level. Because that's what's going to heave, right? I think so, yeah. It's down at the footing level. So if you have insulation below your slab and then you fill the the foundation cavity with some type of insulating material, which hay or straw is going to be your cheapest option, but then you have to keep the water out of it because that will just act like a sponge. Oh, and that would be a mess. Yeah, it'll be uh, a shoveling no out what. feet of rotten hay. Oh my goodness! You need an army of goats to clear it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, maybe that's the solution. It, okay, hear hear me out. So, uh, Vermont dairy barns uh, are largely built on the dirt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, piled cobbles. Uh, you build a timber frame structure on top. They do fine while there's livestock in there. But as soon as the farm, uh, you know, uh, moves or goes out of business or whatever, and then the, the farm building sits there, that's when they start to have all kinds of problems. It's because the livestock keeps it, it warm enough that the that doesn't get the frost heaving. So we're going to load up this uh, foundation hole with sheep. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Then you're going to need the, a staircase or a ramp that the sheep can get up, and you're going to need a water source. Do you really want them to get out of there? I think you kind of want them to stay in there to keep it warm. Am I wrong? Well, the sheep will want to stay in there in winter, but they're going to have to get outside. Yeah, I guess what I don't know about farming is everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This comes from Pete. Hello, FHB fam. Your favorite bearded interior designer here from Caledonia, Ontario, Canada. I'm smirking just thinking of Patrick struggling over this one. <laughs> I think I get that just fine. Uh, we recently conducted radon tests at our 1880s old farmhouse. The radon test kits are conducted during the winter season when the windows are shut and the furnace is on. And then the testing pod is placed in a space regularly occupied. When I discussed our result of 44 BGM2 with my wife, does anyone know what a BG is? What's a BG unit? Becker I think it Rouse. might be a BQ. BQ. Oh, my bad. Becquerels. My uh, dyslexia I still didn't know is what kicking it was, in here. But... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was yeah, happy so to know. I'll give you the, the mid the mid read science break. It's one of three units measured to use to measure radioactivity, which refers to the amount of ionizing radiation released when an element such as uranium spontaneously emits energy as a result of the radioactive decay of an unstable atom. All right, man, we're, we're deep in the sciences today. This is pretty cool. Uh, he says, when I discussed our result of 44 B BQ meters squared with my wife, I was happy to note we were lower than the concerning and actionable level of 200 based on Canadian standards. Below are my two questions. What are acceptable radon levels in the States? It seems the range is here, uh, zero to 200, not actionable. Uh, 200 to 400, consider action, 400 to 600, actionable and dangerous. The wife brought up a great point that I had never considered. We grow many of our own vegetables and store them in the basement in a constructed cold room cellar. The space is heavily insulated from the remainder of the house and cooled in the spring months to extend the food supply, but the exterior mass stone wall and concrete floor of the cooler is exposed uh, similar to the basement. Uh, would radon affect food stored in a space such as this? It seems like radon levels would be higher here. We did not place the tester in the basement at all because it is not an occupied portion of the home. Love to hear your thoughts, uh, Pete. So first, what is the uh, actionable and unactionable levels of radon in the U.S.? You going to take tackle this, Ian? Yes. So it is four picocurie per liter. So you have to then convert Pico Curie to Becquerel's. Apparently Pico Curie is one of those obscure United States only units of measurement. So I was really surprised to find out that our level 
translates to 183 becquerels per meter cubed. So, so it's our, way lower? Our standard is lower and more stringent than Canada's, according Which to Which seems the like the first ever. <laughs> yes, I was I was blown away by that by that wow. knowledge. So the risk here is that uh, radon can give you lung cancer, right? In fact, uh, radon uh, exposure is thought to be the second biggest risk for lung cancer, uh, besides uh, smoking, right? Yep. So, are, should we be worried about the food stored in the root cellar? So I, I, I dug pretty deep into this one and found out that Pete's wife found a, a pretty massive rabbit hole that you can dive <laughs> down into about radon and food and radon and wine. And I did not learn enough to make a, a definitive statement on the, the podcast about it, but there are two distinct camps. One that says it's not a problem, don't worry about it. Radon is carried through the air and does not settle into any uh, food or wine bottles that you would store in your basement. And then another camp that is just totally freaked out by it. Uh, we I should point out that um, uh, I believe fruits and vegetables are uh, covered with a semi-permeable membrane. Right. And it is conceivable to me, and you know what I don't know about biology is everything, but uh, that they could respirate and take in gases from the space where they are. And I think there is evidence for this because you can ripen a tomato, for example, by putting it in a bag with a banana, mm -hmm. which gives off uh, potassium, or I don't know what it give, gas it gives off, but it has a high component of potassium, which is slightly radioactive. Yep. That's another part that I, I read was some foods have radon naturally occurring in them in small amounts. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting stuff out there about food storage and basements and uh, when we have our after show and talk about things that we wish we knew more about is is food <laughs> biology and science going to be one of your topics patrick it's going to be wine because i learned you're a <laughs> subscriber to wine spectator uh I, when we dug into this subject you I, I can't believe you don't get it just by virtue of living in greenwich i would have thought your property <laughs> tax has covered a subscription to wine spectator cigar the door-to-door -door -door wine a seller door. salesman does come around pretty often um no i I think it's a really uh, interesting question and probably one we have no business answering, yeah. uh, except to say that why not test the space to even know if it's worth worrying about, right? If it's really low, uh, I, I think you could just clear your mind of worry. Yeah. And I think you could spend days trying to Google the answer to this and not get anywhere. My guess is there's very little research on this or none. I think there is, but it's competing. So you end up with with groups that seem very knowledgeable and, and accredited that disagree with each other, much like structural and chemical and mechanical engineers. I was going to say much like building science. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff, uh, you're perhaps our uh, most knowledgeable uh, food biology panelist. Uh, what do you say about this? <laughs> I, I mean, this is not... Uh, is it, I mean, I researched thought, but I think, you know, the, the way that radon interacts with the human body is active. You know, you have to be exposed to it directly. It's not like a heavy metal that builds up. So I'm guessing that it's not a problem. And mitigation of radon isn't uh isn't like a complicated process and so my my thought goes to like could you just mitigate this area where you store your food if you're truly concerned about it uh i'm sure you could I, you know it's not free you, and it's not uh you have to run a fan uh in the in the active systems right they're passive mm -hmm. and active but you know running a you know fan 24 7 uh has got an energy penalty right but just lining it with plastic, Poly, you know, just do polyethylene sheeting and tie it and tape it and seal it. 
that steal the food in there or yeah. Uh, yeah, seal off the space? Se- seal off the space. Uh huh. I think that might make a lot of sense is to just make a containment area. <laughs> Huge Tupperware container. <laughs> I was going to say giant Ziploc bag. Yeah. Once again, I'm hoping that uh, folks who listen to the show will have some thoughts on, uh, for Pete on what to do about this. And is it a problem? I'm, I'm guessing uh, we're going to hear from folks who have two different opinions, which is not going to get us anywhere. Um, boy, we only have a couple minutes. Do you think we can do this? Here we I go. Think so. this, is a, this is a fun one. we got to yeah. close on this. Uh, hey, fine home building podcasters. Really enjoyed the podcast and your insights. Thank you. Years ago, my father and grandfather were reshingling wood shingle roof on the barn, and I was tagging along. I was probably eight to 10 years old. The ridge was simply two one by four cedar boards nailed together and then nailed to the ridge. It didn't have a woven cedar shingle ridge. Many of the nails on the original ridge boards had pulled out. They were probably 10 common sticking out about an inch or so. This is where my memory gets foggy. I sort of remember it was the particular, particularly the nail on the sunny side that were being uh, withdrawn. Being a curious slash naive kid, I asked why the nails were left sticking out. My grandfather said they had been fully driven when the ridge board was nailed down. By my, my calculations, that would have been around 1920. And he said the sun had pulled the nails out over time. I'm not sure, but I think he was implying that it was the gravitational pull of the sun Was this just my grandfather throwing some answer my way thinking I would forget about it? Or is there some element of truth to his answer? My guess is that it would have been related to moisture and the expansion and contraction of the wood and the nail moving in the easiest direction. Over the years, I've seen nails that have pulled out, but not too often, probably because material and fasteners have changed. Thanks for keeping us us informed and chuckling, Josh. Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, What do you guys think? Gravitational pull of the sun pulling out the nails. That's awesome. That seems the most plausible in my mind. <laughs> That's why my headphones keep falling out of my ears, right? <laughs> uh, Face in the sun, they fall out. If you take just the statement of the sun pulled the nails out over time, it's it's a half truth. I think what's <laughs> happening is, especially in a roof strapping situation, it is taking on moisture from the air or from rain and getting wet and then repeated drying out and wetting over a long period of time uh, can back those nails out. Yep. I, I love the concept of gravitational pull. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Uh, but of course, you know, this board is getting soaking wet at times and then baking in the sun. Do you think uh, like wind loads on the roof would have any impact on whether or not nails are coming out? I don't think so, but, you know, I I think it's very context specific. Maybe, you know, if it was really getting hammered, maybe. You know, the only time, well, I've seen nails back out a couple times and asphalt roofing shingles, uh, if they nails don't go into the roof sheathing, uh, they will back out and it doesn't happen right away, but you always see the nail head eventually uh, pop mm-hmm. through the granules of the shingle. Uh, I, you see this a lot on hips and ridges because the buildup is so thick. Uh, I think oftentimes it doesn't even hit anything. And then like wood siding, especially on the south and western elevations, if the siding nails don't hit the framing members, I see them uh, have backed out before. Uh, in that instance too, but any other thoughts? I think you got it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what are we going to talk about uh, in the after show, Andrew? Well, actually, Ian came up with a fantastic topic and I was going to let him talk about oh, it. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the things within the, the building trades and maker space that we wish we knew more about. And Patrick's, uh, Food biology doesn't quite fit into that, so I'm interested to hear <laughs> what type of uh, trade thing that he, trade skill he wishes he knew more about or had more experience in. Uh, I know I've been leaning on our listeners uh, to help produce the show pretty heavily this week, but I'm going to ask for one final thing. Um, uh, one of my uh, Facebook feed conversations was related to the lead times for Windows, 
And folks were saying 26 weeks for this one manufacturer, which struck me as completely uh, outside the norm prior to COVID, but I'm guessing it's pretty typical. And I'm going to ask folks who listen to the show to uh, uh, please let us know what you're waiting a long time to get building wise, because I think it is of great interest still and probably making projects more costly than they would otherwise be. So I'd love to hear more about that. And stay tuned for the uh, after show. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining me and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep Craft Alive. Stay tuned for the after show. Bye.